Public Works Committee meeting. It is uh, 6.30 p.m. February 22nd, 2022. We are in the council chambers. Uh, five item agenda tonight, first of which is a resolution uh, for the approval of the cooperative agreement with the Minnesota Department of Transportation for SP 1814-08 TH371B South 6th Street Reconstruction Project. And we have Engineer and Public Works Director Mr. Paul Sandy online. If you want to take us through this item, go ahead, Paul. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can everyone hear me all right? We're good. So um, what this agreement is, is the formal agreement between the city and MnDOT and also MnDOT and the county as it relates to our cost share responsibilities okay. and future maintenance um, of uh, some of the items on the corridor. So in these types of projects, the city participates in sidewalk, uh, some retaining wall, aesthetic treatments, um, we're participating in the surfacing of Greenwood Street, which is our street, and uh, the signal at Buffalo Hills Lane. We pay a, a leg of that because of Buffalo Hills Lane intersecting South 6th Street. Um, we're also responsible to pay for any related utility improvements that we do on the project. Uh, the only utility improvements that are on this project is some water main work that we have worked with BPU on designing and including in their construction drawings, MnDOT's construction drawings. Um, the schedule on the back of the agreement outlines what we're all participating in. And um, we can go into more detail on that if, you, if any of you desire. Uh, what we're looking for tonight is to enter, uh, adopt the resolution which enters into the uh, cooperative agreement with MnDOT for the 2022 construction of South 6th Street. Uh, the project goes from a thousand feet south of 70th Avenue, which is kind of down by the bypass. Um, they're doing a mill and overlay up to Greenwood Street, and then from Greenwood Street to Joseph Street, it's a full reconstruction. Like I said, we're participating also in uh, Greenwood Street. Uh, MnDOT is realigning Greenwood Street to come in perpendicular to the highway. We're finishing that street off with our local project, but uh, MnDOT is having us pay for the surfacing of the gravel and the paving on Greenwood Street, they're paying for all the grading on our local street. So I guess I'll open it up to questions, Mr. Chair, um, that the committee may have. Yeah, I have a couple of clarification questions. So the sidewalks, we pay to install the sidewalks. Do we also maintain the sidewalks in the winter, say for snow removal? We don't pay. So how this project kind of worked was, MnDOT does have a responsibility to provide ADA accessible routes on their trunk highways. Uh, how this project kind of ended up being the way it is, is that we applied back three or four years ago for uh, federal funds along for a sidewalk extension on South 6th Street. We ended up turning, uh, being awarded those fund and funds and we turned them over to MnDOT. And so um, basically uh, we're paying for a small portion of that stuff, with, which is basically the red coloring in some of the um, medians and, and things. And so really the sidewalks that we're getting are from our grant money, but MnDOT likely would have put those in anyways. And so we actually did MnDOT a little bit of a favor by applying for it, um, receiving the money, and then MnDOT covered our 20% match. So they uh, there's typically a 20% match that comes with federal funds. They covered that for us and did all the design and engineering for the city. Try to remember that next time we get more sidewalks on our highways. Um, the other question I have, we have the city covering uh, $307,897.03, the county covering $115,969.15. I'm just curious what the state's uh, remainder of this entire project, I couldn't find it in this document. That doesn't matter a ton, I'm just curious. Um, you know, Mr. Chair, I'm not aware of what their most current cost estimate. I was just looking through the agreement here. I think it actually lists it in here. Um, what the county is paying for is their leg of the signal, which is 94000 And then there's some cabinets and things they have to pay for at the signal for their leg also. So both um, the city's paying for their leg, which is 94000 So the signal um, on Buffalo Hills Lane 
You can see in the other schedule items, utilities, sidewalk, retaining wall items from sheet number three, that's about 180,000. Greenwood Street, about 21,000, and then a state furnished cabinet, so a portion of the cabinet that we have to pay for. Okay. For a total of 307. But I'm not aware. I can share that with you if I get, if I get that. From it, it, it's not really relevant to whether or not we pass this, but I'm just curious what the rough estimate of the entire project is. Three million, two million, four million? I have no idea. I think it's north of three. It might be getting close to four, but I'm not okay. exactly sure. Okay. Any more discussion, guys? Comments? Concerns. The, the only question I had was whether MnDOT would be realigning that uh, Greenwood intersection. Um, I know they don't like those acute angled intersections, but Paul already man answered that, so I'm happy to see that, that was included in that. So no question, just a comment. Great. No question. All right. Anybody have a motion on this? One? I would move to recommend adopting the attached resolution, uh, which enters into the cooperative construction agreement with MnDOT. For the 2022 construction of South 6th Street, uh, Trunk Highway 371B, from 1,000 feet south of 70th Avenue to Joseph Street. Second. Motion is second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, second item on the agenda is a Approval plans and specifications and authorizing the bidding for improvement 19-02 for the Cuyuna Lakes State Trail project, uh, the NP Center segment specifically. And uh, this is an item we've had in closed session a few times, but Mr. Sand Mr. Sandy, if you wanna walk us through this one, go ahead. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. So. As you recall, um, we broke this project up into three segments. Uh, what we're calling, what you're, what's in front of you here tonight is the NP Center segment. That is all of the work that's on the NP Center property um, or all the work we're bidding out. As you recall, um, the owner of the NP Center, Mike Higgins, is participating in this project and uh, performing or self-performing a lot of the work on his own. Um, the NP Center segment is broken up into two separate projects one which we consider ineligible costs to be uh, reimbursed by the DNR, and one is considered eligible costs uh, to be reimbursed by the DNR. Um, so what you see here tonight are both of those projects. Um, you have the trail approximately, or you have the trail and you have the MP road and lot. The NP road and parking lot is the ineligible cost, and the trail is the eligible cost. So, um, how this project will end up working out is Mr. Higgins will be self-performing a lot of the removal work himself, the removals of the old roadway, the parking areas, the old roundhouse, um, and a, a majority of the grading work. We are supplying the materials for him to assist in grading and uh, placement of gravel. And then the NP road and lot estimate is what um, we are showing it will cost the city to basically garner the right of way that um, Mr. Higgins that we entered into that agreement for. So the MP road and lot total estimate being $292,446. Um, you'll notice there are some contingencies and engineering legal admins in there. So uh, the subtotal of construction without any of that in there is 216,000. You can see the trail approximate cost, which is DNR eligible is 112,101 without the contingency. The, the total with those added in is about 151, and that's what we're estimating that project to be. Um, so besides this segment, we'll be coming forward at a, at a future meeting for the Westerly segment. Um, we do have a closed session on that tonight to discuss some easement acquisitions that we have on that segment. Um, but that project is also getting very close to being designed completely and final plans and specifications ready for bidding. So this first segment, uh, like I said, broke up into two separate, uh, being the uh, basically the right-of-way acquisition project and then the uh, paving of the trail as the trail project. So um, if there's questions about this or um, how this project is going to kind of work, I can answer those now. Otherwise, we would be looking for a motion to approve the plans and specs. Um, I did include a layout sheet to kind of show you how that was planned to be laid out uh, through the site. 
um, and uh, allow staff to move into the bidding phase of this project. Just for clarification, Mr. Sandy, the cost to the city that's non-reimbursable, the total of that, is it the $292,446.45? Correct. That was the, that's the uh, realignment of the parking areas and the city uh, responsible costs for um, paving and the curb work. And that is after the in-kind work by Mr. Higgins? Correct. Okay. Yeah, we had estimated, I think, that work right around, I don't know, is Scott online? I think we had estimated that work to be north of 300000 to where this was almost like a break-even type venture. But Scott, correct me. Yeah, that sounds right. <clears throat> Scott has a better microphone than you. Does he? <laughs> oh, yeah. Do I sound muffled? Must be loud. <laughs> A little louder than Paul, yeah, but um, yeah, that's that's really all I was wondering. We, we walked through this before, and that's kind of what my understanding was. I don't know if you guys have any questions, comments. No. Motion when we're ready. Uh, <clears throat> move to approve the plans and specifications as presented and authorized bidding for improvement 19-2 with the anticipated bid opening date of March 29th. Okay. Oh, is this the right one? Yeah, mm -hmm. it is okay. Uh, is contingent yep. on approval of plans by the Minnesota DNR. Second. Motion is second. Any more discussion? Anything else you want to add in, Paul? I guess you can't. I don't think made so. a motion. Um, all in favor? Aye. All right. Motion passes. Item number three. Here we have a uh, request. Uh, what is this? Approval of plans, specifications, and authorized bidding for improvement 22-01. I believe this is the seal coating project for this summer. Um, if you want to walk us through this, go ahead, Mr. Sandy. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee again. Um, so our annual seal coating project, uh, we set aside 150000 a year in our capital improvement plan to do uh, seal coating or pavement maintenance. Um, we usually uh, do a crack seal project before this. We're working on those right now, those plans and specs to get that out the door. And so what we'll typically do is, is we'll go and crack seal all of these streets, those being College Drive. There's two small legs of Mississippi Parkway where we reconstructed College Drive back to Mississippi Parkway with the roundabouts. Um, South Fork Street and Willow Street, which kind of goes up the hill there by the Speedway gas station. 10th Street Southeast, uh, which is over by uh, Willow Street and Brook Street. We're doing Brook Street uh, from 8th to 13th, um, and then two streets up in Northeast, 10th Avenue Northeast and 8th Street that were reconstructed back in 2019. Um, we do seal coating. We've had very good success with um, our seal coating projects over the years. Um, we do believe it adds a lot of life to our streets. Once that initial layer of oil is kind of worn away, the seal coat seals the pavement surface up again, provides some friction uh, surface on the roadway to help with ice control. Um, and uh, we just strongly believe that this is a beneficial project for our streets that are newly or, or within the last 10 years of being reconstructed. Uh, over the past, well, since I've been here seven, eight years, we've been picking on all the streets that are basically 20 years old and newer. And we're pretty much at the point where we're caught up now. So we'll be seeing some newer roads that we've recently reconstructed more and more um, on these lists um, to get seal coated a couple years after they're done. Um, what we're looking for here tonight is to approve this plan and the estimate, which is I believe just south our $150,000 number, $149,390. Prove that to go up to bids with a planned bid opening of March 18th at 10 a.m. All right. Thank you, Paul. Any more discussion, comments? Straight forward. Got a motion? Yep. Move to, uh, move to recommend approval of the plans and. Sp oh, I think I'm on the wrong one. Sorry. There's a lot of attachments on this one. Um, motion to recommend approval of the plans and specifications as presented in authorizing the bidding of the improvement 22-01 with an anticipated bid opening of March 18, 2022, 10 a.m. 
Central Daylight Time. Uh, I second it. Motion is second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. It's endemic. All right. Item number four is a uh, consideration of proposed section 320 amendment language change. This is to do with our code enforcement. We had a workshop. It was directed to uh, send it back to SPW, and here we are. We have um, some language changes in here. Um, I did speak with Mr. Chansky on the phone last week uh, regarding this. Uh, this. This came up in our agenda. Um, I had some changes in mind, but we can discuss those right now. I'm just going to give Mr. Chansky um, a chance to go through this. So, Mr. Chansky, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, again, um, this is, as, as you stated, um, kind of response to what we as staff heard, what I heard um, during the workshop on January 25th. And it's an opportunity just to update our ordinance. We felt that, you know, it would be best to have this updated and into our city code um, to reflect the desire of the city council. Just make it, one, clear for staff and also clear for our residents as to how code enforcement is to be done in the city of Brainerd moving forward. So, um, not a lot of whole changes, uh, mostly in the uh, administrative offenses, schedules, and fines and fees section. That's section 320.07. Um, under authority to issue, we had to make two quick changes. Um, under the people that are authorized to cite, we saw the city planner that goes back to the, an old position, so we struck that, made that the community development director, and then we also added the assistant planner as an individual able to issue um, uh, administrative citations. Then going again into section 320.07, a um, couple of the main changes uh, quickly is um, subdivision, current subdivision three states that the city council shall adopt by resolution or schedule of fines for offenses initiated by administrative citation. Right now it's pretty much, it's $100 each citation, we just keep doing that. Um, and sometimes it's effective, other times it's not effective. Um, so we have two back-to-back -back recommendation changes here, subdivision, what is now going to be two, and then our new subdivision three. Uh, subdivision two is now um, schedule of fines for offenses initiated by administrative citation shall be the first citation is $100, the second citation is $200, the third citation is $300, the fourth citation is $400, and the fifth citation is $500. So if you get to a fifth citation, you'd have a total of $1,500 in citations. Um, and then that goes, which leads then to subdivision three, which is a new change. And I think from what we heard at the workshop is after the issuance of those five citations, if we get that far, if compliance has not been had at that point, um, the offense shall be brought before the Safety and Public Works Committee for determination of further action to correct the violation. Such actions may include, but are not limited to abatement, issuance of further administrative citations and amount determined by the committee or legal action, depending on the type of citation or uh, violation, there's different types of legal action that can be taken. Um, what we have now on occasion um, actually, uh, is certain properties that we can cite them over and over and over and we get up to 15, 20, you know, $2,000 worth of fines and they just do not comply, they do not communicate. Um, and so the idea here is we find them and we get to a point, if they haven't responded by the fifth citation, they're likely not going to respond. So at that point, it's bringing it back to the committee and going, okay, what do you want us to do moving forward in this situation? You know, th th this talks about a few things. Again, it's not limited to that. If there's other remedies that the committee would like to see based off of that, of that issue, then staff would be directed to do that. Um, and the other ch big uh, change is subdivision five just says the city council shall adopt written procedures for administering the administrative citation program. Well, we just wrote the procedure in here. Um, that shall be, uh, be conducted solely on a complaint-driven basis, which is what we heard on the 24th. However, offenses of a nature that may result in bodily harm, damage to property, or significant blight may be brought before the Safety and Public Works Committee without a complaint for determination whether, the, whether to implement the administrative citation program. Um, so that is really kind of a synopsis of what I heard on the 24th. Um, one thing, uh, I don't know if you want me to stop there or go into some of the comments we had. Um, yeah, you go, go ahead and do yep. that and I can comment on that. So one of the other things <clears throat> that uh, Chairman O'Day mentioned on the phone um, is we do have, um, based on this, I did hand this out to you before the meeting, 
um, in front of you is kind of a reinspection schedule. Each each um, offense, type of offense, made our main offenses has different inspe reinspection schedules for that first reinspection. Um, and this is something that I, I do agree with uh, with uh, Chairman O'Day that maybe this is something that would be good to have in the ordinance as well. Um, and right now, it is as follows um, for grass. If you get, it's five days, so we, that we issue the initial notice, you are in violation. Um, you have five days correct it. On the letter, it does tell you the day of reinspection. Um, so really, you get reinspected on the sixth of the day, and that is days, and that is five days from the, the date of the notice. Garbage is seven, snow is seven, graffiti is 10, off street, Parking violations are 10 days. Unlicensed inoperable vehicles are two weeks, 14 days. Junk and debris, 14 days. House numbers, 15 days. We're not really sure why that one's different. Um, I'll go to that in just a minute. And then pro any property maintenance issues are 30 days, as well as other general zoning offenses are 30 days. Um, where we get most of these numbers came from historically, I'm really not sure. I tried to do some research, couldn't really find where they came from. My assumption is, is they were uh, administratively created either by the former building official or the formal, former city engineer when building was under the engineering department. Um, so again, these dates would be something, obviously, you'd be looking for the, for the committee if you think that they're right, if you think that they should be in the ordinance. Um, and then I have a kind of asterisk after that initial inspection. So notice is sent. You're given these many days to correct. The inspection happens. If compliance is not had, then a citation is issued every seven days. So then it's uniform after that. It's seven days after that. Um, and again, as always, our goal is compliance. Um, so if someone does comply and they communicate with us, um, generally with very quickly, if we issue them a citation, they call us and say, yep, sorry, you know, I missed the first letter or whatever. I got it fixed. We go out there. Yep, they got it fixed. We waive it. We waive more citations than we actually come before the committee at the end of in in, in October um, for um, assessment. So after that, that Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll I'll just pause and take any comment that the uh, committee sure. has. So yeah, my, my my concern was the the language in here that said each day is a new offense. So if we took this as is, it would basically say that. After five days, you have five citations and you would have $1,500 in fines. That was a concern. So obviously we can't leave it that way. Um, seeing this fee schedule or the, the reinspection schedule, it's, it works, but it seems like almost more work for staff to follow this, all these different dates and, and numbers of days. So I'm going to leave that. To you guys, I think what we're going to end up doing, I don't think we're going to motion to just have it as is. So probably more of a directional issue for today or our item for today. But I would I would have you look at those those days. And if you guys are fine doing that, I don't personally see a problem with this. I just feel like for your uh, department, that might be easier to to simplify those day, numbers of days. Um, the other thing was the amount of fines. And I think upping the fine by $100 each time is, is okay. Um, as long as, like you said, you're working with the citizens, um, making sure that they're communicating. And, and if they're not, then they're not, they're not trying. Um, and then the, the last thing off the top of my head right now, sending it to SPW committee as a, a after the fifth citation, just to, to decide what to do. I have no problem doing that. I don't know if they're in the future going to have a problem doing that. But coming out of there, is it just whether we want to have that as the final decision like we did in a situation last year? Um, or is it a recommendation to the council? Or do we leave it as either or? I think that's what we need to discuss here. So uh, Mr. Pritchett, you have something? Um, I. Two things aside from what you were saying. Uh, first of all, you get, you get the notice, you get the citation. Can you ask for an extension? Absolutely. I thought so. Yep. It's uh, actually later in the ordinance. It does say reasonable extensions. It does direct that. Okay, good. Um, cities shall attempt to work with any owner to resolve a violation, including but not limited to responding to reasonable extensions for compliance, which we absolutely do. And I agree with Chairman O'Day. I think kind of having, 
you should maybe look at categorizing things in, in the, uh, re the enforcement reinspection schedule and then make it clear whether it's working days or days and then do it, you know, like 10, 10 working days. If you're gonna go working days, keep it off of that kind of, you know, the five divisible and if it's straight up days, keep it off of the 14, but you're not gonna go in and inspect on a Sunday, I would assume. Nope. So it might be working days might be better. It also give them, a, you know, a little bit of time. Mr. Erickson? I, I agree with all that. Um, these number of days in this schedule seem a little arbitrary, as you mentioned. Um, if we can clean that up and categorize them, as Mr. Pritchett just said, um, I think that would be beneficial. Um, <clears throat> off the top of your head, David, I mean, can you give us how many of these, like, five citations are you running into? Is it common? Is it one to two a year? Or, I mean, can you give me a... Because that plays into... Mm -hmm. The we could have 20 that, in here next the month. volume that we mm. would be processing. <laughs> <I'll snow. laughs> we probably could have 20 in here next month, but I don't think that's going to happen. You know, it, it all depends on, you know, I could see it being yeah, heavier in May once the snow starts to melt. Again, we are going complaint-driven mm -hmm. at this point, so, so it kind of will be based off of how we receive complaints. Mm -hmm. Or, again, if it's a very serious issue that we say, like, this needs to be addressed, um, and then we bring it for for you to direct us whether to, to enforce or not. Um, you know, right off the top of my head, if I think back to the role that you assessed, that you um, certified for assessment last year, um, I think there were probably assessed close to three dozen properties, and I would say probably 18 to 24 of them were of that. I'm not replying. Okay. I think bringing it to committee is going to be more effective, so I think it's a good step. Um, but I do think, what are your guys' comments on whether we make the final decision in uh, uh, Safety and Public Works Committee or if we make a recommendation to the full council? If we make the final say here, what happens if they don't comply with that? Well, I guess that's... And would do they have the opportunity to, to appeal that our final decision? Well, I think at the end of the year we have appeals every year. It would end up there at council. So I guess where I'm going with that is my sense is that council wouldn't want to have that large volume. They'd want to see it at the end. So right. We have final decision here. If it's appealed, they would, council would still see it at the end of the year. I agree because I think what we would run into is we would have somebody show up, we would have the entire discussion, have them run their case, and then we would have the whole thing happen all over again at the city council meeting. So might as well have that just at the end of the year, yeah. as we usually do. Okay. One other thing, just, just something to think about, instead of having them come up one every meeting or whatever, could you just, okay, here are the, the ones for, for our committee in March and just have it like be the second meeting? So then you might have three or, you know, instead of mm -hmm. one here, one here, and one here. That's something absolutely we can do. I don't know if 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 you want that in the ordinance, fine. I think that might be more of administrative and kind of yeah, up to the chairman. Of, if you want me to bring it once a month, might. we'll bring it once a month. Yeah. Okay. We have the mayor here. Do you have any any discussion <laughs> points? Yeah, I, I have concern with the dollar amounts. But I, first of all, I have a question. So before we had... Uh, civil penalty not to exceed two thousand dollars, but regularly at the end of the year, twenty six hundred dollars would come up as as a number, and I think there were some fees that were associated with that. Uh, how were we getting to the twenty six hundred dollars before? Yep. So a couple things. So with that, one of the reasons we struck that is there's a couple. Conf First, this is per offense. So some some of these properties that had like I think one this year had like thirty two hundred dollars. They had multiple different offenses. So that's that's one of it. They had. An inoperable vehicle, junk and debris, and long grass. So they had three different types of offenses that all had citations against them. Also, with this administrative offense may not uh, subject to a civil penalty not exceeding two thousand. When I've looked into that, what that has meant is that the individual citation itself cannot e exceed two thousand. Not that once we get to two thousand total, we have to stop. It's actually more when you look at it the the, the the individual citation cannot exceed two thousand um, dollars, and that's where kind of how one reason we, I, I struck that is because 
with this proposal we have, it does stop. It stops at 1500 unless further direct, and then pending further direction from the Safety and Public Works Committee. Okay, and at that point, and just so I'm clear on this, what are you thinking as a, as a committee is your next step then? I mean, I understand what we've got written here, but feel it out and let me hear what you're thinking. Are we just gonna restart the process and we're gonna go back to, okay, back to week one, it's back to $100, are we gonna start hitting people with $500 fines to continue it going? Because what happens once someone gets to this point, we stop, we bring it to you, and we say, what, what's the next move? What's the next move? Mm -hmm. And I think it depends all on the def on the offense. So, say if it's grass, I think the decision would be to send one of our mm -hmm. lawnmowers in there and charge them for it. Are they going to pay that? I don't know. Um, but I don't know what uh, what other answer there is for something like that. Um, you go down the line, you can clean up snow removal, graffiti, um, off street parking. You can have their vehicle towed maybe out of their yard. Um, None of this is fun stuff to do to anyone, but they are offenses. So I think there's, it, it just depends on what it is. I don't think we're going to come back to the committee and say, add another $1,500 and then they'll pay, you know? Yeah, it, well, first of all, they're not going to pay. Correct. That, that's not going to happen. We're just going to end up at the end of the year with people that have gigantic fines, <clears throat> which is more of my concern. I, I'm very concerned about from my standpoint with this is that I'm, I'm not concerned with the money and I, this to me looks like we're interested in money. I'm not interested in money off of this whatsoever. The idea behind this is not to get people to pay us, it is to get people to clean up their stuff. And I understand the, the general concept of what we're trying to do with this. <clears throat> I'm just wishy-washy about where this goes and how that actually accomplishes that goal. Because if it comes back to you and then you say, okay, we're gonna go in and, and take someone's vehicle off their property, I don't think we can do that. If it's graffiti, I don't think we can go and paint someone's garage. I don't think we have the legal right to do that. So my question is, how does this get us to the end result that we're actually looking for? Maybe, maybe a better way to look at it, because as far as a citation, fine. I don't know how you go any other direction than using money as a, as a penalty initially. But maybe, maybe as it comes back after a fifth citation, we make sure that we have our attorney available and just go over what our options would be legally. Go ahead, Dad. At some point, are we able to assess the, the fine? Mr. Jansky? If I may, a couple things. First, I'll answer uh, yeah. Councilman Erickson, your question. Okay, go ahead. Is, yes, yeah, so what we do assess them at the end of the year. So if they, anything at the end, our, our assessment peer roll period is September 1 to August 30. So at, you know, after in October, when we bring this to you, anything that was left unpaid does get assessed to their property taxes. Um, if I can't answer, just maybe put a few more items of clarification, Mr. Chair. Yep. Um, yep. Couple of things also. One, when this comes to you, we will always provide you with a recommendation. And again, it does provide, it is kind of case specific. Um, for example, we've had, we had been dealing with one up until about the beginning of the year when they finally kind of just stopped um, a situation where someone was operating essentially a salvage yard out of their yard um, and the street and constantly getting complaints with the neighbors and we pretty much did everything we could. The next step was with that and we would have brought it had they just not decided to stop um, was I did talk to the city attorney in that situation. We could have gone a legal route where the city applies for, believe it or not, a, a um, uh, a restraining order against them for doing something that is against the ordinance. If they comply, if they don't, if they violate the restraining order, now they're in contempt of court. There's that whole legal process. Also, um, also technically to our code, any um, violation of the city code of any manner can also be considered a misdemeanor. Um, we don't go that route, obviously, for you know long grass. <laughs> we don't have the PD come knock on the door and charge you with a misdemeanor. But there are multiple routes we can go depending on, you know, if it's abatement, legal action, other things, depending on what the offense is, some more drastic than others. Again, if it's long grass, we can mow it. If it's garbage, we can have someone take the garbage and throw it away for them and charge them for it. Just kind of depends on what the offense is. I will add, too, and I know I think you had more comments, but I'll add, too, that the city 
is more than willing to work with every single one of these people and they need to know that and you guys are good about letting them know that. So if it gets to the point where this is what's happening on a fifth citation and we're asking our lawyer what we should do, they are clearly trying to poke and prod. This is, that's that type of situation. So, but Mr. Erickson? That's the point I was gonna make. You know, we're talking about when, where we are at that point where there's been a complaint, we've been through five cycles of citations. Uh, so we're well down the road of, uh, you know, this is, you know, I understand and I agree we're not you know, looking to make a profit or revenue off of that. I mean, it's, it's, compliance is the goal. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to make, that was the point I was gonna make, is we are well down the way of, you know, we've been a complaint, we've been through five citations, and now right. we're looking for the best route. But Mayor brings up a really good point about if we get to that point, then there is action that needs to be taken. And what, what's that going to be? And we're, we're willing to do it. Yeah, and I, I think we kind of leave that <coughs> open ended as far as what happens after that fifth citation. <coughs> Bring it back to Safety and Public Works. We'll make a decision. It won't be a recommendation to the council at that time, it'll just be the decision. But we need options at that time, too. You have any more questions? I, so, oh. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to reiterate my concern about the pricing structure of this. Grass, right, just because it's number one on my list, five days, with every other citation coming seven days afterwards, 40 days into not cutting your grass, you owe us $1,500. That's a horrible PR for our city. I love the idea of making sure people cut their grass, but if I have people lining up in this council chambers, with $1,500 citations for not cutting their grass for a month, that's ridiculous. Yep. There are some things in here that are very concerning to me. I'd, I, I'm concerned with this as a whole just because it, it, it appears a little half-baked at this point. I'd like to see the, this ironed out so that we have the answers to this, so that when, when we have someone coming to us and saying, okay, how are we addressing this? Again, the goal is to get people to address the issues and this is taking a very ham-fisted, knock-on-the-head type of approach to it. And I want to make sure that we're not taking that. Yeah. And code enforcement's tough because it is the hand and fist. It is, it is, it is what... Yeah, we're not, we don't have a lot of carrots. I mean, we're, we're basically sitting with a stick. One thing we could look at is, is maybe making the citations lower where, you know, somebody pays 50 bucks or 100 bucks after a few rather than 200 I mean, it's a lot of these people... You know, it is problematic for them to pay that. But I know that, you know, we're not after the money. But, I mean, you'd still want to have something in there, a little bit of teeth. It's incentive. But, yeah. So I think as, as you look into it, something like that, like the mayor was pointing out, five days for grass, maybe that's not the right number for, di for number of days. We're looking at that number. You know, maybe, maybe you look into offenses and, and go, this, these are the seven-day offenses, these are the, the two-week offenses, and these are the one-month offenses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple. Just Keep it simple. Days. The, the one major thing I'd like to add to this is that we're more concerned with repeat offenders. We're more concerned with stackable offenses where it's not one offense, it's multiple offenses. I'd like to see some kind of approach where we are looking at the people that are regularly on this list and coming up with a solution for that. Maybe your third citation for grass is $500. Maybe not week five. Maybe it's the third time that, we, hey, we're talking about grass with you again, you know, I, I still think that's ridiculous, so, so please don't do that. But the, the, the solution has to have something to do with these properties that are continually having multiple things. And I think at some point we have to address that problem as opposed to stacking offenses and just continually saying, hey, we need you to pay. No, I agree. Um, I think that is pretty good direction. We still have one more item to cover here for... I guess my one question I have, do you want to see this language again before yes. it comes in ordinance form? Yeah, I, I would like you to come back with it in two weeks. Sounds good. At SPW and yep. just with everything that was talked about here and change some things and I think we'll, we'll have it at that point. No so. problem. All right, moving on to item number five. We have the revisiting of the street light what do we call this? Street light policy. The street light policy. And this is another one for Paul Sandy. If you want to walk us through this one, go ahead, Paul, if you're still there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, 
So uh, per the committee's direction, we, we got uh, finally with the suppliers that supply these fixtures and we found a little more of a middle of the road option that kind of gets to the same look we were looking at. Um, and it, it is a little more, I think, in a price point that um, maybe this committee and the city council can swallow long term. Um, and so it's what we did. Um, the two options, obviously, that you guys had selected last time were called um, the LED burn, which is the one for like a commercial type setting. And then the uh, option two, which is the Rainier, that is for more of like a residential type setting. Those were on the high end of costs. And so what staff did is we uh, got with the suppliers and they came up with uh, this option 1A, which is called um, an epic type fixture. Um, and it's kind of the same design, but it's a little more in your price point. And then the 2A option is called the Breckenridge. Um, we went through and we ran the same scenarios. So the first uh, option uh, cost sheet shows what it kind of costs per light. You can see option 2 and option 2A, the um, Rainier compared to the Breckenridge. You're looking at about 1976 for option 2 and for 2A about 1644. So it kind of breaks that in kind of the midpoint of what we currently paying to the higher price option. And then the same with um, option one and option 1A, the commercial style lights are existing. Cobra lights cost about $2,700. We were looking at an option that costed about $3,800. This one kind of the midpoint at $3,068. Uh, kind of get at the same look you guys were looking at. Uh, we also went through and did some cost scenarios uh, for capital projects um, that we did for the first options we had. And you can see that midpoint is kind of reflected in how much more we would pay a month. For example, uh, for the North Brainerd construction project, if we were to re uh, replace uh, 23 of our residential lights and six of our commercial lights, we would be paying around $162 more a month to BPU. If we're looking at Washington Street in 2025, there's 126 uh, Cobra headlights that would get replaced with um, option uh, two or option 2A. You would be looking at approximately with options uh, one and, or just options uh, one, you'd be paying about $8,000, uh, or no, sorry, $1,000 more a month, about $1,200 more a month. With the other option, it's about uh, 900. So we tried to kind of split the gap there and uh, make it a little more palatable. Um, the policy itself that we had proposed a while back has not changed. Um, got some, um, just really got to fill in the, the standard light fixtures um, under each of those categories. And so at this point, I'll leave it up to questions, comments, um, anything you guys have. Um, how this would kind of happen is, you know, we would uh, move through, you know, if this policy were adopted and you guys selected fixtures you would like, we would move through 2022. Um, if the committee would like, we would just replace the North Brainerd lights. It wouldn't put us too far over budget in our, in our utility category. Uh, but then we would continue budgeting for new, uh, as we have new street projects come up, we would look at that budget and increase it depending on the number of fixtures we're going to replace in each year. So um, I guess I'll open it up to questions or comments or. I have a, I have a quick question uh, looking at yep. these charts. Typically in a, a street, new street project, how often are we, are we replacing every single light? Not Are they ever? Um, okay. Well, it would be kind of a change in approach, I guess. You know, BPU would replace lights if they needed to get moved. For, for example, a sidewalk, a pedestrian ramp, um, we would typically have them move the pole, but they would maintain the same light. If we started moving towards a new fixture, it would be kind of a policy decision by the council on if they want to begin replacing every street light with every capital project that we do for road construction. So that's kind of a decision that I think the, the council needs to make as a future policy decision. Um, or you know the other choices to begin replacing them as they lose fixtures, um, or as the fixtures go bad. So, kind of two options there: replace them with construction projects, 
or replace them <laughs> as fixtures go bad. Right. As a cost saving, it would make way more sense just as lights fell over and got run into to replace them. But then you'd end up with a hodgepodge of different types of lights, or they just fell over from the snow. I hope. But um, I mean, Mr. Chair, I mean, you could again. look at it as you could look at it as doing like the commercial corridors, you know, more visible lighting corridors. When those go, you know, mm -hmm. you could replace all the commercial lights, and then you know the residential ones. You look at maybe as there. I mean, there could, there could be a hodgepodge too. So, um, but then again, the residential lights don't impact our fee nearly as much as the commercial ones do. So right, it's a difference yeah. of a. What three hundred, two hundred and fifty dollars on a, a two thousand dollar light, something like that, yeah. for the residential. <clears throat> I guess I would be more comfortable going ahead now that we've found something more middle of the road. It's it's really not that big of a jump, um, but I'd be interested to see if council's interested in um, upping our light game. Um, I really want to see this on, on major projects like uh, Highway 210. I think if you look at some of our surrounding towns, you can see that they have decorative lighting and it actually is a, a big pull. It, it looks 10 times better than what we have on South 6th right now. And uh, the cost difference is minimal um, on a big project like that with lights that are going to last, what, 30 years, 40 years. Um, I'm totally comfortable with it. Um, it all depends on the rest of the committee, what, you guys, what your guys' thoughts are. I kind of like the idea of, of looking at certain areas, you know, and you, you look like Jenny Street probably doesn't need new lights, you know. Um, oh, correct. Yeah. <laughs> but so I think, I think what we're motioning or, or looking at is as we do streets projects. Right. And then depending on the project, too, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Or is it just a... A new standard of light so as we redo them eventually over a period of what is it what does it take us 40 years to to redo all our streets right now yep about 40 years <coughs> so 40 years from now we'll have and jenny street will have new lights is that then jenny street will probably finally get new lights but they'll be different yeah and that that is a key point is this would be very slowly phased in mm -hmm. it's not like you're going to see that jump of um oh what is it hundred thousand dollars you're not going to see that jump of eight thousand dollars a month tomorrow you're going to see that jump over 40 years right you know if you annualize that it's what five hundred dollars a year yeah yeah mr erickson uh, i'm still a little hesitant but more comfortable with the cost um especially as it's spread out like that um definitely need to avoid the hodgepodge so if we do pursue this it just needs to be major corridors and as construction projects come up. I think what we what we found out was that BPU only had how many of the current lights and poles sitting around? We thought they had a huge stockpile. It was very had, minimal. They had yeah, like a dozen. Very minimal. Okay. So, yeah, if anybody's got a motion. Make sure we're on the right one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I move to approve the street light policy with options 1A and 2A selected as lighting for commercial and residential applications, respectively. Second. Motion and second. Any more discussion? None. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Um, Mr. Chair, just an uh, uh, item of, of point. So we, with the current Mississippi Landing Trailhead project, they're looking at park lighting in that project. There is an area in this policy that relates to park or sidewalk lighting standards. Um, you know, we've been working with the um, uh, Trailhead Committee and um, it'll eventually be in front of the park board as far as what the lighting kind of looks like for that park. We've kind of gone under the assumption that that's kind of gonna dictate what our future lighting in our parks looks like. We've been really trying to um, put it as a, a look that is kind of like what we have on College Drive, but then they also had some more modern, sleek options. And so we're having WSB's landscape architect really look at those and 
Um, that is going to kind of remain the way it is in that yellow form right now until we, you know, work with um, that pedestrian walkway slash trail lighting standard. Um, and that's certainly something we can bring forward to the committee as we move through that trailhead project um, to um, if that's an agreeable solution. Yeah, I like that. I think matching those mm -hmm. as much as possible would be ideal. So um, we have a member of the park board here in the audience, and he just heard you. So um, whenever that gets through the park board, um, just bring it back to us. And <laughs> He's got the kind of what? <laughs> he wasn't listening, I guess. Never mind. Um, yeah, so I mean, once we select a fixture, we'll bring it back to the committee perfect. and just make sure there's a concurrence there. Perfect. Um, before we adjourn, we do have a few people here. Uh, Mr. Halverson, I don't know if you were, wanted to make a few comments or if you're waiting for regular counsel. Just He's here to watch the show. Okay. All right. And one show, one other show. Great show. <laughs> All right. We are adjourned. All right.